Great. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's uh, Leaders Initiative talk. My name is Stephanie. I will be monitoring things here on the back end. If you have any questions or comments you want to put in the chat, we can we'll monitor those throughout the talk. Um, you can also feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions um, throughout the talk. And we will also have Q&A at the end. I will be sending out a Qualtrics evaluation for this event um, towards the end and in follow-up email. So if you have time, please fill out the evaluation. We definitely appreciate your feedback and like to hear which topics you're interested on in, and um, hearing in the future. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Elizabeth Letowski. She is a research fellow in the Department of Neurology at the University of Michigan. She is interested in the researching casu casual mechanisms of the relationship between diabetes and dementia. She uses a forward genetics approach to examine the links between glucose metabolism and cognitive impairment in gene by diet and drug intervention studies with the goal of identifying therapeutically relevant targets. And with that, I will turn things over to Liz. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, one thing that I also do like to point out as I'm uh, starting talks like this, I'm actually a genetic epidemiologist by training. And so I'm coming at the uh, focus of understanding cause between diabetes and dementia um, from a very different and very human perspective. So I think that I don't need to tell this group that there is a very high prevalence of diabetes and dementia, both in the United States and in the world. Um, and there is quite a bit of difference in race, ethnicity, prevalence levels as well as sex differences between these two diseases. What I think might not be as obvious is that the, um, the amount of time that these two diseases occur together is more often than would be expected by chance. There is upwards of 1.4, um, up to two and even greater than that, relative risk of dementia in those who have been diagnosed with diabetes. And so while there is a higher prevalence in men um, for diabetes, there is actually a higher level of dementia in women. And so trying to understand um, how this, um, how these two diseases relate to one another is part of what I'm trying to uncover in my own research aims. So while there had been a lot of um, observational studies relating the, the prevalence of diabetes and dementia. That really wasn't enough for me. Um, as part of my PhD work, I used a technique called Mendelian randomization to discover evidence of causality between these two diseases. And again, um, in my work, I found that race and ethnicity was a key factor as well. So a much higher relationship between diabetes and dementia in African-Americans and Hispanic Americans, for example. Unfortunately, because I was doing my work in a veterans program, I didn't get a chance to look as much at the sex differences. However, unbeknownst to me, um, while this was going on, Amy Dunn within the um, Azarowski lab at Jackson Laboratory in Maine had started a very large study to look at a gene by diet interaction to explain some level of glucose tolerance in Alzheimer's disease predisposed mice. Um, and so, and then simultaneously, Maria Telpukovskaya, Pukovskaya, um, had done a single nuclear study looking at cognitive resilience in Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that part of that study also revealed targets that are druggable, very much related to diabetes. And so given that background, I thought it made a lot of sense for me to join um, the Kazarowski lab myself. Um, I was very interested in understanding a little bit more about causal mechanisms between glucose metabolism and cognition, 
Um, and so I wanted to join a wet lab. Unfortunately, it was a little more wet than usual last week, given that the uh, the floor, of, there was a pipe burst um, basically in the floor above us. Um, but all part of the all part of the science program. So a few aims that I am trying to accomplish as part of my work in the Kazarowski lab. One is I would like to continue the use of my genetic background, but now applying that to a mouse model to understand the mechanism between glucose metabolism and cognition. Use that genetic mechanism to perhaps edit and make a new mouse to test that mechanism. And then also while that work is going on, perhaps take a look at some drug intervention studies um, to understand how a diabetes drug may change the response to glucose metabolism as well as cognition. So in my first aim, I'm looking at the genetic signature. Um, I hope to find the trait relationship. So a particular phenotype that will explain most of the variance in the relationship between these two different mechanisms. Assess whether that trait is indeed heritable, map the trait to different regions of the genome, and then determine an appropriate gene reason for region for experiments. So let me step back because I know um, doing systems genetics is not necessarily what everyone does. Um, so I'd like to take a moment to really describe the mouse model that we use as part of this and why this mouse model is so critical in our work. Um, first, it approximates human diversity. And so, as I mentioned, the diversity related to humans, it's important to be able to look at that diversity in a mouse model if we are trying to address something that's relevant to humans. So on the left side of this diagram, our AD model, is um, we start with a female hetero, a female mouse that is heterozygous for the 5X FAD transgene. But otherwise, this mouse model is built on a strictly C57 LAC6 mouse. And so otherwise completely inbred for B6. But the, this, um, the 5X FAD transgene um, over, has five mutations which co-express, um, are highly expressed in the presenolin-1 and amyloid precursor protein genes. And so that's an important element of heredity from an Alzheimer's disease perspective. On the right are the BXD mouse panel, um, which consists of many, many different strains. The BXD panel was started more than 50 years ago by um, breeding a B6 female with a DBA2 male. And over many, many generations, these mice have been bred to be able to produce individual strains that form part of the overall mouse panel. A couple key things to note is that these individual strains are fully inbred and homozygous with respect to various, um, various genetics that they inherited from the B6 side as well as the D2 side. Um, and so here on our diagram, we're representing the, the dark, the black is the B6 strain versus the DBA strain. So you can see on any particular mouse strain, whether they have received their genetics from the B side or the D side. So in our model, we're taking that AD mouse and breeding it then with multiple strains across the BXD mouse panel. And because of the fact that the, the 5X FAD mouse is heterozygous, for the 5X FAD transgene, each of, the, each of the litters consist of those who have inherited that transgene, but also their corresponding non-transgenic counterparts. And so in this way, we are able to 
assess the differences that occur between those particular strains with the transgene versus those without the transgene. And because this mouse panel has been bred over multiple generations, and in fact, in some cases with an advanced intercross kind of approach, the mouse panel enables a segregation of about 5 million different sequence variants. And so we can assess um, what the impact is, again, of that B6 versus the D2 mouse strain. So just wanted to take a moment to describe that in a little bit more detail. And so building on the study that Dr. Amy Dunn performed prior to my arrival in the Kazarowski lab, I have been able to take advantage of the data that she generated from 39 different genetic strains from that ADVXD mouse panel under varied, varied conditions. More than 6,000 mice in total were assessed. And so a couple key things, um, two different diets, one high fat, high sucrose diet um, versus a 6% extruded diet, basically standard chow. Being able to look at the genotype, whether it's the AD or the non-transgenic mouse, um, again, the litter mates of those um, same strains, and then two sexes, male versus female. So basically eight different groups as part of the, the study assessment. A couple key measures and a, a lot more work um, has been done in um, Amy's original study, but the key measures that I was interested in were the glucose metabolism and cognition measures. So a couple tests that I'd like to be able to describe. One is the glucose tolerance test. Basically, mice that are fasted receive a glucose injection, and then their glucose level is measured every 15 minutes over a two-hour period in time. This is very similar to what is done in humans as they're being assessed for diabetes. And typically for humans, it's this end point. Um, what's the level of glucose at the end point determines whether or not you have diabetes. However, in my particular case, I'm interested in what's called postprandial glucose or also called peak glucose, which occurs about 15 minutes after that first injection. This is something that is similar to evaluating someone who has eaten a meal. Um, and so what does their glucose jump up to right after they have consumed um, food? So on the other side, um, to be able to measure cognition, we use a contextual fear conditioning assay in which mice are moved to a novel environment that's different from their home cage and they experience over about a 10 to 12 minute period, they experience four different shocks. And so the first day they are, which we call the training day, they learn that this environment is a place where bad things might happen, that they'll experience this shock. And so then the second day they're returned to the same environment and we measure the percent freezing that that mouse exhibits based on the fact that they might have remembered that this, this was an environment in which they experienced the shock. So that is a mechanism for measuring um, memory. And so that, that's the value that we're using for our cognitive measure. In the case of this study, this gene by diet study, we took both of those measurements at six and 14 months. So we're, evalu we're able to evaluate a change in time that has occurred with respect to those two measures. And so let me orient you to this graph. The, um, the x-axis is a measure of that peak glucose change. So remember that's the, that's the value that is taken about 15 minutes after the glucose injection. And so what we're measuring on the x-axis is how that, how that value changed from six 
to 14 months. If that value increased, that's considered to be poorer glucose metabolism. That is that the mouse is not responding very quickly to that infusion of glucose. On the y-axis, we've got a measure of the change in memory from six to 14 months as well. And so higher percentage freezing represents a better cognition. So if the mouse has increased in terms of percent, in, in percent freezing over that time period, their cognition value, we're considering that to, have, to be that cognition has improved. And so what you'll see here is that this graph is a measure of Alzheimer's disease females who were on a high fat, high sugar diet. And over this time period, you'll see that their cognition declined when their glucose metabolism also declined. And so in the case of high fat, high sugar diet, um, for females, they experienced that about 20% of the variation in that change was related to this change in peak glucose metabolism. Under those same conditions, males on a high fat, high sugar diet, also with that AD transgene, did not experience that same kind of change. So quite a different effect that we see in females versus males under the same set of conditions. So based on that information, we now wanted to look and see, does this particular trait, and the trait that we're measuring here is peak glucose change. Again, that's from six to 14 months. What you'll see here on the x-axis are all of the chromosomes. Um, and so we're trying to assess, is there a particular place within the genome that has a, a statistically significant relationship with this trait of peak glucose change. And so that's essentially quantitative mapping of this uh, particular trait that we've defined. And then on the y-axis, this is the minus log of the p-value of that relationship. And so a higher peak is more statistically significant. So what we did find for peak glu glucose change is that it did have a high heritability, that is a, a good portion of the, um, of the variance in peak glucose change is related to genetics. And so that's important for um, using systems genetics to be able to understand uh, disease mechanism. We also noted that the disposition was polygenic. So even though you see a, a large peak here on chromosome nine, there are also peaks that occur across the genome. So it's not just in that particular area, but there are probably additional factors across the genome that may be influencing this relationship genetically. And so then it's a question of what does that mean and how do we use that information to be able to further understand how this disease might be genetically related and what how we might then be able to do something about it. So a couple more vocabulary words. Um, I used a tool called the Genome Muster, which is a tool that is built and maintained by the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine. And what Genome Muster allows us to do is look at the differences between different strains of mice. And so in my particular case, remember, I was interested in the difference between a black six mouse and a DBA mouse. And so what you'll see on this chart is at a particular location within the genome, the allele value in a B6 mouse is G versus in a D2 mouse is A. And so that's an important difference that might be useful in terms of understanding causality and looking at genetics to understand causality. So a couple other um, vocabulary words here um, on this side, uh, 
a SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, um, is the particular location in the genome that we're assessing. So this is a very specific base pair location on the genome. So chromosome nine at this particular base pair position, and then a reference SNP ID is a typical naming convention. And this is important because as we learn more and more about genetics of mice and humans, um, the reference ID is something that translates from one version of the genome um, assembly to the next, even if the base pair, if the understanding of the base, base pair position might have been altered in one release to the next. And so RSID is a good way for us to start um, understanding um, some particular locus that that could be of value to us in looking at disease cause. So, however, looking at a particular location, um, I don't, I'm trying to think if that shows up. Yes, um, looking at many different results that occur across the genome. Here's a particular region of the genome. I was looking at that location on chromosome nine. And so what's different between the B6 mouse and the D2 mouse? at those particular locations. But there were 57,000, more than 57,000 polymorphisms between the two. Um, and so lots of different databases behind this that evaluate and keep getting updated as, as we learn more and more. This one is based on, so Genome Muster points to the Sanger um, version 39 of the data set ensemble 104. So basically think of that as just a version control number. Um, within that region, we found that there were more than 54,000 unique RSIDs. This is a lot of information. And so how do we start narrowing it down? However, um, within the through the use of the variant effect predictor, which is built on ensemble 111, so a little bit later than the database that we started with, we found that there were 22 high impact RSIDs referencing about 19 genes. And then after we did some exclusion on olfactory receptor genes, which typically differ from species to species. So we felt like that was inappropriate to, to focus our area of research. And then there's some genes that look like they're probably going to be genes, but have not yet been um, truly assessed as and given names. We did get down to about five genes that um, were related to high impact RSIDs. Nevertheless, there's still potentially 81 consequences associated with those different specific base pair locations within the genome that we would need to assess and understand differences in um, potentially uh, transcription level data. But it's a starting point. It's a starting point for us to at least be able to narrow down to a subset, a handful of genes to take a look at. And so just looking at a particular one of those genes, um, the PRDM10 gene, some previous work that's been done both in mice and in humans, the heterozygous knockout in males has been associated with body mass, body and fat mass traits the homozygous knockout turns out to be completely lethal, but heterozygous um, does have some interesting literature information. In humans, we were able to uh, use the religious orders study and um, ROSMAP project to be able to assess the relationship of this particular gene in both cross-sectional and longitudinal cognition. And it has been associated with decreased cognition and also increased brain pathology, one of which I've noted here in terms of tau tangle pathology and where the PRGM10 gene fits in terms of other potential genes to look at. Additionally, genome-wide studies that have studied SNP interactions with the PRDM10 gene 
has been associated with phosphorylated tau, and it's additionally associated with type 2 diabetes and diabetes complications, as noted on the type 2 diabetes knowledge portal. So just a first step in understanding is this particular area of the genome worth pursuing? There may have been some previous evidence that indeed there is. We need to be able to do additional work on the rest of the, of the other four genes that were identified in that particular location. So still more work to do in terms of our first aim of looking for a genetic signature associated with this relationship. Um, and then look at gene expression data, which may have been published to hypothesize consequences. AIM-2, of course, will depend on the genetic mechanism that we discover as part of AIM-1. And so I won't talk a lot more about that today, um, unless there's questions. Um, but the last part of my work is to focus on the intervention study of a diabetes drug for our strain response to this relationship between these two phenotypes. So I wonder if I should pause just for a moment to see if there's questions at this stage. Hi, how are you? Yeah. Thank yes, you for, fine. Thank you for uh, your presentation so far. Uh, one question that I have in 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 these transgenic uh, mice that in this case have two the presenilin one and APP inserted in the genome, right? Have you yes. have you one? Of, let me put it this way. Put it in context. My question. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the DG four five ten model that they found that the insertion of the transgene tau uh, cause uh, disruption of different genes in the in the genome of the mice, and further genomic analysis uh, revealed that uh, of the genes affected, this might contribute uh, to the phenotype that was observed by the insertion of of the of the transgene. Unfortunately, other um, amyloid or tau model and mice have not done the same genomic analysis to see whether the insertion of the genes of the transgene have caused any disruption of, of genes in mouse genes. So uh, do you think that that could impact your analysis in terms of the genetic signature and whether you, uh, uh, you know if someone have looked at the Resilining one and APP gene insertion where where they are in the genome and whether it's affecting genes. I there's definitely been a lot of um, additional work that's been done. I see something in the chat as well. Um, there's been a lot of work within our lab done for this as well. So to see if it affects other genes. There's a lot of other genes, I mean, <laughs> potentially, but no. I guess I don't know. My question is whether the insertion of the transgene is in a specific chromosomal region that affected uh, the spread, you know, the, the sequence of the genes in those loca locations. So do we know where presenilin 1 and APP are inserted? We do, but I don't off the top of my head know exactly where that is. Yes, but we could do a follow-up conversation about this. Yeah, <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thanks for the question. It looks like there's something in the chat as well. Yes, there is a question in the chat um, it's from Amanda Marr. It says, I apologize if I missed this earlier. Mice are being fed high fat and high sugar diet. Is there a potential additional impact of sex differences and fat metabolism on mitigating glucose impact? Or perhaps this does not matter since much since human diet is often high sugar and high fat together. Potentially, yes. Um, there is definitely a potential that that both could have 
could be playing a role in this. Um, in assessing in particular high fat, high sugar, um, I did find that there was a lot of variation explained just um, in fat metabolism overall. And so, yes, definitely there, there could be an impact. It could be um, one or the other or both or the interaction of the effect. And so don't quite know the answer to that yet, um, but definitely worth keeping an eye on as we progress to the next steps. Another chat question. Oh, she says oh, thank you. Okay. okay, cool. All right. All right, let me talk a little bit about um, the drug work that we've done. So as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Maria Telpukovskaya um, had done some single nuclear um, analysis to assess individuals with cognitive resilience. And so let me describe a little bit about what that means. There are some individuals who have shown um, that they have a high degree of pathology, which normally we would associate with cognitive decline, and yet they exhibit cognitive resilience. That is, they have not seen any cognitive deficits. And so it's important to be able to understand what's different in these humans, what's different in these mice that exhibit this resilient um, phenotype as opposed to being susceptible to that pathology. And so doing this single nucleus, um, profiling both in mice and humans simultaneously allows us to be able to understand what's important and translates and is translatable then to humans as we're doing the, the mouse work. So in this particular study, what was found was that there was a particular cluster of excitatory layer four or five intratelin selephic neurons that were differentially expressed in both our mouse population as well as the human population that we that was conducted in parallel. And so then the question is, um, you know, what does that mean and how do we, what do we do with it? Um, so, however, the particular interest that I had in this study, in addition to understanding causality, was the nomination of potential drug targets that arose from this study. So because of the value of the upregulated mouse genes, we actually started with the 61 mouse genes that were part of that cluster of IT neurons and used those as a starting point. There were also some human genes that were that were nominated as part of that, but because we felt that there was something that was not quite as well powered in this study to be able to understand humans, we also went to some additional outside studies, additional human studies that were very well powered, powered to understand what's already known about these 61 upregulated mouse genes. So some evidence that these mouse genes were important were established in some genome-wide studies of resilience um, from some mini mental, mental state exams, from protein me measures of those who are cognitively resilient versus those who are, are not, um, but also looking at potential druggable targets. So what I've identified here is Agora's criteria for understanding druggable targets, um, basically looking at a small molecule, molecule ligand, looking at potential antibody feasibility, but also known safety criteria. And so through this extensive research about different kinds of genes and the potential for these types of genes playing a role in drug targets, um, 11 targets were identified at the end of the study, but then a few top drug candidates were identified. Um, the top candidate was actually velnacrine, and the second candidate was miglitol. 
So one thing that was useful as part of this study was that velnacrine was already a drug that had been established for cognitive resilience and um, had, had been on the market, but was actually pulled for toxicity reasons. But it, it helped to validate our approach to evaluating what kinds of drugs might be appropriate targets for addressing cognitive resilience. And Meglitol just happens to be a diabetes drug. And so was very much within my wheelhouse of wanting to understand a bit more about this. And so we decided to run a, a drug study. And so the first step of this drug study is to evaluate um, certainly control and Meglitol. Um, we, over time, we will be assessing different resilient and susceptible strains that have been identified from some of our other work within the Kazarowski lab, but then also assess glucose tolerance and um, contextual fear conditioning to, to assess cognition. The first step is to do a pharma, pharmacokinetic study using standard black six mice to assess how the drug is absorbed in various tissues, and then also to determine mouse appetite. Sometimes when you're trying to get a drug to be part of food, um, it's important that the, mouse act the mice actually eat the food. And so that's an important first step. And then after that, to conduct a full blown study to understand the impact of a potential drug. So we're in the midst of doing the pharmacokinetic study. We have had the mice on, and these are just the standard B6 mice at this point. They started a diet on October 27th of this fall. We ran con contextual fear conditioning on the mice in December and we expect to sack a few of the mice this week as a representative sample of the various groups, those male and female drug and no drug um, relationship and look at the tissue absorption within tissues that we believe are important, um, blood in particular and brain of course, because we care about cognition and we'd like to see how well that um, those tissues absorb this particular drug. Some of some previous studies have been noted that um, miglitol doesn't pass the blood brain barrier, but we'd like to assess that for ourselves. Miglitol tends to be cleared through the kidney. And so we expect to be able to see that as part of our study. We also would like to collect fecal samples because miglitol operates, um, operates basically by slowing down the absorption of carbohydrates or the breakdown of carbohydrates into sim more simple sugars. And so it's important to be able to understand how that is affecting the gut basically. And then we expect to run glucose tolerance on the remaining mice after that. So we have been monitoring this over the life of the study, both before we started feeding the diet as well as after. So the blue lines on this chart are when we started different diets, not that we changed the batch, but it was a new lot. And so I like to be able to see when we make slight changes, even if they're small. Um, so basically standard chow that is fed by our ULAM group prior to time zero. And then um, Miglitol was introduced and then we had a new batch of Miglitol delivered around week seven. Um, so what you do see is that the pace of weight gain has slowed for male mice, not that, not that they're losing weight on Miglitol, but that the pace of the gain has slowed seems to be occurring more in male mice versus female mice. Um, and the time by diet effect size, small p-value, not, uh, not necessarily a huge effect, um, but there is definitely, you can see the lines starting to diverge that those in chow um, are continuing to gain weight while those on miglitol 
appear to be starting to level off somewhat since they've started taking this, started eating this food. Um, we also did notice that um, right when the mice started the new diet, I was a little bit worried. We were worried they weren't going to eat the food, but it turns out they were very excited by this new gourmet food, apparently, um, and started eating the, the diet. So our chow diet in this case is really just a repelleted version of the same basic Purina 5K54 um, chow diet that that the drug is mixed in. Um, and so the mice were very excited when they first received this new diet, but the excitement has worn off over time. And you'll see that that is declining in terms of food intake at the same time that the average, um, the average mouse weight per cage. The, the, um, the mice are caged in four in units of four. And so it's really just the average weight gain versus the average food consum consumption that we that we can measure in terms of how the, the mice are housed. But we also did a um, contextual fear test as well about a month and a half ago. Um, again, remember the training day is mice in a novel environment. They receive four shocks about uh, three to four minutes apart. And then we measure at the very end. So after the fourth shock, we call it post-shock four, we measure their percent freezing. So they have received shocks and then there is a very small period of time at the end of the training day when they do not receive a shock, but it is right after they have received prior shocks. The test day then we measure again we take them back to that novel environment and there are no shocks that day. But again, we measure the percent freezing without a shock. And our results from that post-shock four on the training day, we were trying to determine, is there really a difference between the um, cow diet and miglitol diet on training day? We saw no variation based on the diet. We did not see variation based on sex. And unfortunately, we did see a little bit of a difference between- Liz, yes. Liz, thank you. Can you please tell me what you're actually, you say post-shock four, but I don't know what the indices are on the on the Y on the Y axis. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's percent freezing. So percent the freezing. amount- thank you. Yes, the amount of time that they, yeah, they are spent freezing. Um, and so we did notice that there was a difference in morning versus afternoon on the training day. Now, some of this, there's also a couple of other, there's a couple of things that could be going on on the training day in terms of time of day. It could be morning versus afternoon in terms of just we've interrupted their day. It is when they'd rather be sleeping is something different in the morning. Um, these were actually two different people who did the tests. I am not as good at mouse handling as my counterpart, Hannah, is at mouse handling. You can see the variability in her results um, is a lot tighter than, than mine is. So it could be different operator, could be different time of day, but something, something to keep an eye on. As we're looking at, oops, skipped, whoops. What the heck? The second day, um, we were looking at the percent freezing from, again, did they remember what happened the prior day? And so again, looking at diet, we did not see much difference in the diet from um, the previous day. We did not see much of a difference in um, six, and we did not see a difference in morning versus afternoon. Again, a little bit more variability in the morning versus the afternoon person, um, but did not see results. So, which is interesting, um, this is at an early time point. These folks, these mice are about four months of age at this stage. And so the fact that we have not seen much difference in terms of cognition 
um, doesn't necessarily mean that we won't see much difference over a longer time period. Um, but at least it's something to, to get a baseline of uh, establishing the memory at this stage. So then for our full bloom study, what we will do is um, look at several different strains of BXD mice, both resilient as well as susceptible mice that we'll assess over time. Um, and this will be a much more full blown study um, trying to allow the mice to age up. So start them on the diet as they are progressing to adulthood, um, running various glucose tolerance tests. You know, again, from the work that we did in our systems genetics aim, we're very interested in looking at the change in glucose metabolism over time. And so being able to run an early glucose tolerance test followed up by about not quite 10 months later, another glucose tolerance test to be able to understand the difference um, and see if a drug made, if this drug made a difference in terms of glucose tolerance, but also in terms of, of memory over that time point. Um, and then, so we expect that this full-blown study will be about a year and a half in terms of overall duration. So lots of work to do as, as our mice start arriving. So a couple conclusions from the work, both in terms of AIM-1 as well as AIM-3, and then the magic mouse that we hope to make. Um, there are definitely some areas of, that are considered heritable traits that have been modified by both sex and diet. We expect that this particular region of the genome, chromosome 9, holds promising mutations that will be useful to modify in an experiment to test whether that region really has an impact. And then certainly looking at FDA-approved diabetes drugs. There's there's a potential to evaluate several other drugs, but um, just starting with one is probably a good a good approach. Um, and then just my overall goals in terms of where we go for the future is I you know we started with this diabetes dementia relationship at an observational level, saw evidence of causality in humans, indicate showed a different level of biological mechanism by using a gene by diet mouse model that reflects human diversity, and then also looking at potential drug targets. My ultimate goal, of course, is to then take that back into a human level and be able to translate it to humans so that it has value there. Um, and then with that, I would like to thank certainly the overall Catherine Kazarowski Lab, um, Amy Dunn, whose work provided a ton of value um, in terms of my being able to step right in as I walked into the, to the lab. Um, Hannah Lyons, who is my cohort in crime and conducting all of these experiments. Maria with her work in drug targets. And then, oops, too fast. Dave Bridges, um, who's my mentor as part of the diabetes um, team that I'm part of, part of um, and also the MADRC, the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So it looks like there's a question, Marsha. Oh, this is obviously fabulous work. I'm really impressed. <laughs> um, Thank one, you. One the one thing I wanted to talk to you about is something that's always bothered me about looking at diabetes in the amyloid expressing mice. So obviously the transgenic mice have, you know, their transgenes potentially could be expressed in the pancreas. So has anybody ever looked at the pancreas to see if a, a, B, APP and A beta are produced in the pancreas and whether that compromises glucose tolerance. I mean, I don't think it explains your genetic work, 
but it's just a little thought that's been in the back of my mind that maybe the mice are not perfect to recapitulate human Alzheimer's disease, right? If if humans don't express APP in their pancreas. It, it's just something that I'm just wondering if you've ever thought about. I have not thought about that specifically. Um, it's a good question. I'll add that to my list of many, many things to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Liz, this is Hank. I, I missed a chunk of the presentation. I did want to know, you're collecting fecal samples and what's the reason for that? What do you get from the fecal samples in your study? Yeah, I'm trying to look at energy absorption in the fecal samples. So a concern that I've got, you know, in the chart that I was showing where the mice are not gaining, you know, the mice, like the mice are not gaining as much weight when they're on Miglitol, which is not uncommon for some diabetes drugs, right? We've seen that that happens in humans that they don't, they start losing weight when they're on some of these drugs. And so I wanna make sure that it's not causing some harm in terms of energy absorption. And so fecal samples are a way for me to assess that. Okay, thank you. Marsha. I have another question, if Marcia doesn't. <laughs> no, Marcia, I go ahead. Like I definitely do. Um, you might look at hyperactivity also, right? Because uh, we showed, for example, in the tau transgenic mice that, um, that the animals um, eat more food, but way less because they're uh, just hyperactive all the time. And it's pretty typical to see increased activity in transgenic animals okay. as they age. I know these aren't okay. transgenic, so that's not an explanation, but um, but activity level could, you know, it's just another thing that's pretty easy to check for, just to okay. monitor their overall activity, you know, in the dark and the light and make sure that they're not um, losing weight because of just more activity. Yeah. The one thing I still can't figure out, I, I don't know if I, I didn't emphasize it so much here, is one of our particular cages of female just seems to be like ravenously eating. Like, I don't, there's no difference here. They're just B6 females. So uh, but, I, I, I see the animals shredderate the food. That's what I call them, shredderators. They, yes, they just no. chew, they chew the food up into tiny bits and but they don't consume it actually they just chew on it right and I, i've, and I've never actually yeah yeah i've never actually given them something to chew on like i know they make these blocks of wood and people give them dog bones and stuff like that to just chew on so they don't chew on their right. food but it could be that and you might not see that because you don't change their cage and see that you know, there's a lot of shredded food in the bottom of the cage. But. Yeah, except that we're weighing them every week. So we do. We're weighing the food and we're weighing them every week. So we, one of them does look like that's the case. And then the others, it looks like they're actually eating it. So I don't know. Just keeping an eye on it. Looks like there might be more in the chat as well. Oh, I think that's just, let me see. Oh, oh, that's just you, Stephanie. Okay. Other, oh, Hank, did you have says, No, I will, I'll ask my question. I'll just come over and to the room where you're sitting right next <laughs> to me and ask you the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions before we sign off for the day? All right, well, thank you so much, Liz. That was a really great talk, it was very informative. Thank you. Um, I put the Qualtrics evaluation in the chat. Um, I will also send a follow-up email. Uh, so look forward to that. Our next Leaders Initiative talk uh, is going to be Matt Bensky, and he will be talking on February 26th at noon. So uh, thanks for coming out today, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for all the feedback.